It's strange to me that I still hear people use the word extremism or extremist. I know what they mean. Someone's ideas are way beyond the limits of what's popularly considered acceptable. But it's still strange, because we're living in extreme times. It may seem normal to us, but we're teetering on the edge of the precipice of a really tall mountain. Is it wrong to want to take radical action to get away from the edge? Or should we stay here until we fall, because it's more familiar? I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. But before we go on, I need to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Vocabulary Lee. Do you want your English to be Vocabulary Lee? I know I am. Vocabulary Lee, the new app from It Had to Be Said Enterprises. People who use the word extremist don't usually define it. Or they make a circular argument, like someone with an extreme ideology. Extreme compared to what? You could argue you become an extremist when you use violence, or when violence is a possible outcome of your philosophy, but that is not what people mean by the term, and we know that because they never call anything the state does extremist, even though the state causes immeasurably more harm than the extremists it claims to protect you from. And for the same reasons, to achieve political goals. That's why we're never treated to a definition of the word. Because like the word terrorism, any definition of the word would make it clear the state was the biggest perpetrator. <laughs> I mean, see for yourself. Google it. See if there's any definition of extremism, or again, terrorism, that you can find that doesn't apply to the state. If you don't quite know what I mean by the state, you might want to look at this video, uh, but you could do that after, after you watch this one. <laughs> uh, if you want, you know, up to you. Don't let me tell you what to do. The point is, the violence the state commits every day outweighs anything they will ever call extremist. It's just that the state's violence is normal to us. Moreover, the threat of extremism is a useful one to the state because it can claim extraordinary powers over whoever it uses the label on. If you're just a criminal, we can hold you up to 24 hours without charge legally. If you're an extremist, however, well, for the sake of national security, which we don't have to explain either, will have to lock you up on suspicion until, uh, well, well, we'll let you know when we decide to close Guantanamo. And that's the thing about the extremist label. It gets put on Arabs and Muslims most of all, so governments like the US and UK can do whatever they want to them. So it's a racial issue too. Just like all law enforcement, people with darker skin get targeted. If you lived in a slave society, would you oppose all slavery? Or just some? After all, abolishing all slavery is an extreme position. The moderate, and thereby more acceptable position, would be to free some slaves, not all, or to improve their conditions a bit. What if we pass laws banning using chokeholds on slaves and mandating that slavers had to wear body cameras? Would that make things better? <laughs> Maybe. And hey, at least fewer people would call you an extremist. And that's what really matters, isn't it? We should reform slavery. Abolition is an extreme measure, and extremism is never the answer. 
Is that what you think? Because if so, now's the time to wake up from your cultural coma. Let me put the case for radical action the best way I know how, by pointing out truths we all know, or at least can verify. The U.S. government alone spends over $700 billion a year on its military. The military doesn't stand around idle, waiting for something to defend. It sends soldiers and bombers all around the world. The CIA uses weaponized drones it controls remotely from the other side of the world. Because they don't care how many people they kill, careful records of body counts are not kept. But many estimates find that between them, these agencies killed over a million people in Iraq in the first decade of this century. At the same time, they've ruined the environment and destroyed vital infrastructure, so more people will die as an indirect result of these wars. They're also making wars in several other parts of the world. And the news hardly ever reports on them, so we don't know about it, and we don't care. Isn't that extreme indifference? They sent millions of people halfway around the world to kill millions more people, and they're still doing it, but that doesn't warrant the label extreme. It's only considered extreme when you say, we should stop these wars by any means necessary, because the only thing we're allowed to do is vote. And as we know from experience, voting will not stop the wars. The U.S. currently incarcerates 639 out of 10,000 people. That amounts to over 2 million people locked in cages, not including the people indefinitely detained at the border, which number just over 14,000. 2 million people in concentration camps. Is this democracy? <laughs> these prisons, these gulags, destroy freedom. They destroy people's lives, families, and communities, and force the prisoners to work as slaves for pennies, as you probably also knew. If you think they should be there, and they should be forced to work just because a cop and a prosecutor and a judge said so, congratulations, you are well adjusted to a sick society. Are you okay with this too? Sophia, good morning. Are you a little nervous this morning? See? See? You know what a lawyer is? No. No? Do you have a lawyer? If you have no problem with seeing children forced to argue for their freedom in court, again, you're well adjusted. You have internalized the incredible cruelty of this society and decided it's just the way things are. I, on the other hand, think there should be no trials of children, no prison slavery, and no wars on far-flung populations I don't know anything about. That makes me an extremist. If you've been following Edward Snowden or any of the other whistleblowers, you'll have some idea of the extent of the US's surveillance program. It's all secret, so we're not allowed to know anything about it, but we're pretty sure they can read our emails and texts, track our phones and online activities, including how we use cryptocurrencies, because they're not that crypto. 
It has thousands of surveillance drones in the air spying on us. Now there are something like one billion security cameras spying on us around the world. The government is allowed to know everything about us, regardless of the, whether it can pin a crime on us, but we're not allowed to know that it knows. But Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning are extremists for thinking we should know. It's not surprising people attacked them for revealing what the government is doing to us and to people overseas. Those people want, without realizing it, thanks to propaganda, those people want the state to have complete power over everyone and never have to reveal any of what it's doing because those people have been properly socialized in this dystopian society. It's the same reason they attack anti-fascists, anti-racists, journalists, the ACLU, and so on. They've been taught that the ruling social institutions are good, so anything that limits their power is bad. But even despite the extreme violence of these institutions, they could theoretically continue indefinitely. Most of us could continue to survive under a state, even when it makes permanent war on people all around the world, locks up millions of people, and spies on everyone. We can live under occupation. We've been doing it for 5,000 years. We shouldn't. We should be fighting back. But most people would rather tell themselves things aren't so bad. So we shouldn't. Not yet, right? But the natural environment, you know, that thing we need to live, might not be able to take capitalism much longer. We're burning more fossil fuels than ever, which of course isn't slowing down, and climate change is not slowing down. We're producing more plastic than ever, and it's still going into the ocean. Biodiversity is crumbling because species are going extinct faster. And we're still losing the world's most important forest to logging and will continue to do so as long as it's profitable. I'm sure there are plenty more environmental problems that we have, but it's not really my field. I wouldn't tell you you shouldn't go clean up the shoreline with friends on the weekend, but you and I both know it's not enough. I think if we don't take extreme action, there will be extreme consequences in our lifetimes. It wouldn't be considered extreme in a free society, but in a place where the police will beat you and take you to jail for trying to stop environmental destruction, and the news will smear you for it, what needs to be done will inevitably be called extreme. Though I'm sure you could find plenty more outlandish extremes considered normal in other areas of life, there's one more that I'm going to talk about, and that's the economic system. At present, there are nearly 3,000 billionaires, many created during the pandemic. Altogether, they're worth about $13 trillion, up $5 trillion in the past year alone. The World Bank finds something like half the people in the world live on less than $5 a day, and one out of ten people live under the line of extreme poverty. Now, I don't fully trust these official measurements because dollar figures do not necessarily reflect poverty. But if we take them at face value, we could work out that roughly 4 billion people are poor and 800 million people are desperately poor. If these rich people wanted to, they could eliminate poverty. They could probably develop clean burning fuels or recyclable plastic, too. They could transform the world. Instead, they're spending their money to get to space. Are you going to tell me amassing an enormous amount of personal wealth and then using it to make a rocket ship and fly to Mars isn't extreme? But if I said, for example, we should seize their money and give it to the poor, 
I would be the extremist? Okay. And those facts are, of course, just a glimpse into the unprecedented inequality that itself is just a glimpse into the staggeringly complex global economy. It doesn't say anything about government debt, which in the U.S. is over 100% of GDP, and in Japan, over 200%. Does that sound sustainable to you? Have you ever calculated for yourself how much inflation has taken place in your lifetime, or just over the past 10 years? And that's inflation for everything especially house prices and rent. How have your wages kept up? How much less are your savings worth? How much less will they be worth? Entire national economies rely on stable government and resource production and the patronage of huge corporations, and if any of them fail, a new generation of poor people is created in a whole country. The rich could never be asked to stop accumulating wealth, so during so-called austerity, they even take the bones they used to throw to the middle class. There are many signs you can point to and say, this is all unsustainable. I don't know. Maybe we can keep going to the mall forever. But it doesn't seem very likely. I predict a really hard crash that we will never recover from. We've built up this society, this whole civilization, on a mountain of laws and agencies and police and debt. And the higher you build a tower, the harder the crash when it falls. There's no way for science or technology to save us from this situation, because most science is funded by governments and corporations, so that's who it benefits. And the technology that often results from it is patented by corporations, even when they weren't the ones who funded it in the first place. <laughs> what could technology possibly do to make our civilization sustainable? It would have to solve all of our environmental and social problems. Sorry, but we're going to have to solve those ourselves. First with a change in mindset, and then with direct action. There have been various responses to the likely collapse of society as we know it. Some people are trying to reduce their personal carbon footprint or use less plastic because in our culture, we're supposed to just act as individuals. But individual action will do very little. It's collective action we need. I suggest anarchism and decolonization because they are real solutions, unlike techno-optimism and eco-fascism. I get those ideas are tempting. Techno-optimism is about hope and progress, and we've long been indoctrinated to believe in those things. Eco-fascism is pretty much about closing borders and killing people who aren't like you so they won't contribute to climate change. So if you've been brought up to think certain people are less worthy, less human than you, just because they're from different places or look different, you might think it's a good idea. But neither of these ideas have any potential because they do not address the underlying causes. They merely propose to delay the inevitable. The most common response to this extreme violence and oppression and environmental collapse is to do nothing. To continue going about your life, pretending our problems will be solved by the same institutions that created them, and hoping we'll die before it becomes too bad. But do we really have time? How many more years can we keep this going? How many more years can you call people extremists until you realize this is an extreme situation that calls for extreme measures? It's time to shed our complacency and take a brutally honest view of the world, and that will require unlearning a lot of what we believe about it.